Okay, I'm not good like Jen, so I'm gonna use my notes because I wasn't gonna speak tonight, but I'm one of the alternates, so. Right. We're gonna give it a try. Yeah, thank you. So I am Rachel, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about copyright, which I know is really exciting for everyone. But we're going to try to do it through the lens of creativity and kind of a zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance type approach. So copyright fanatics in the audience, please be gentle with me because it's really hard to do this in five minutes. <laughs> copyright, our you know, kind of concept, our US concept of copyright is from our constitution, where we want to promote progress in science and the useful arts. Yarn, though, sometimes we take things too far because handcrafted yarn can be made into something new and something beautiful. We do the same, and we're seeing this more and more since the digital revolution, that people can take works of art, whether they be written, spoken, performed musically, cinema, film, and they can take them and they can make them something better. So our story starts out, we have to take a step back into the history of copyright, and it starts out with starving authors. And how did we get starving authors? Before the time of typewriters and word processors and computers, authors were storytellers and they could make a meager to modest living until Mr. Gutenberg and Germany's impact on copyright came along and said, look, we can mass pr produce those stories. And in the 15th century, he did just that and the Gutenberg Bible kind of started our modern information revolution. So by the early 18th century, there were authors in England starving and Queen Anne, in her wisdom, said, you know what? We need to make something happen for them. So Statute of Anne, 1709, they said, you know what? The publishers can't keep reprinting all this stuff. The author has the rights. Victor Hugo in France built on it. 1886, Bern is not in France. It's in Switzerland. It's a long story. But he said, you know what? Rights of the author trump rights of the publishers. And then we have our American contribution. And our contribution still protects the rights of the author, but they want it to be forever. Mary Bono, Sonny's wife, after he was deceased, said he really wanted copyright to be forever. And luckily, our Constitution says that's not right. So at the same time, the World Internet uh, Intellectual Property Organization, the, treaty, the WIPO Treaty, and the DMCA, all of this stuff was converging to happen in the late 20th century, just as digital tools came along and made it easier for people to bust up copyright control. YouTube came along, changed the world, drove these guys nuts, and within two years, that Viacom group had sued Google and YouTube for a billion dollars. It's still in the courts. It's actually not gonna hit the, the main courtroom until this year or next year. And so what, I'm not talking about piracy tonight. I'm not talking about people like, you know, in some office or warehouse somewhere creating thousands of copies and selling things illegitimately. We're talking about people being able to mix up content, people being able to take that hip hop music with a manga or anime film and blend them together, and our law's not keeping up. So we have things like Creative Commons and Copyleft that are doing that, that are giving power to individual creators to say, you know what, take my stuff, mix it up. Viacom, remember that $1 billion suit with Google? That's Comedy Central, that's Stephen Colbert. Larry Lessig has a new book called Remix that's talking about all of this right here. Those two are on there. Colbert has his green screens, kind of like taking yarn, saying, here's my thing. I'm standing in front of the green screen, mix it up. Has anybody seen any of the green screen challenges? Lessig, the visit, they remixed into all kinds of great beats. We do the same with parody, which is already legitimate in our copyright law. So we've got Spinal Tap, we've got Drawn Together. There's a great one-man show called Blanche Survives Katrina in a FEMA trailer named a Desire, a take of Tennessee Williams' great poem. These are my LL cats, Josh, and I'm a dog person, so this is actually my ROFL dog. Um, but this is, again, goes back to that yarn where someone's taken that work of art that when you go into one like this, Stitching Post and Sisters, and you see all those beautiful yarns. They're works of art on their own, but someone's made them better. Greg Gillis, Girl Talk Mixing, he's pushing that envelope as well, really big, saying, you know what? All this stuff is already copyrighted work, but what I'm making is something new, something better, something good. So here's what Lessig, say. he was, Lessig says. He was formerly at Stanford. Now he's at Harvard. He's a pretty big name in this world and is pushing pretty hard. I'm not going to worry about four and five tonight. We're talking about number one and number three. Get content to the people, let them mix it up, and what's surprising is that suddenly it's starting to make sense economically. We've got things like Moo, 
the place where you can take your photos and have them printed into business cards. We've got Flickr, we've got Cafe Press. We have all of these places where content can be licensed into other things. So I thank you. You can check out snowydog.com for notes and they'll be added more later tonight. But think about copyright, keep pushing on the freedom to create and to keep pushing our society and our culture forward. Thanks. <laughs>